I'm Lisa Evers. I'm so glad you're joining us for this special episode of Street Soldiers. It is our Street Soldiers Town Hall on the NYPD and you. Policing our communities, they've been making changes, but have they gone far enough? And I'd like you to take a look at this quick, brief, short video that kind of summed up some of the things that have happened over the last couple of years. So please take a look. No justice, no peace. to let people know that we are humans and our lives matter, I'll do that. There was outrage on the streets for months after the 2014 illegal police chokehold death of Eric Garner, an unarmed black man, followed a few weeks later by the fatal police shooting of Michael Brown halfway across the country. With frustrations at a boiling point, two NYPD officers were shot and killed in uniform. In an exclusive interview, NYPD Police Commissioner James O'Neill tells me the tragedies became a turning point. It was a very difficult time to be a police officer back then. Uh, it was, uh, you know, the demonstrations every day and then Lou and Ramos were, were brutally assassinated on uh, December 20th. Uh, it was a dark time for the NYPD. I think it was a, bar a dark time for, for, for the city. I think it was a dark time for the nation, too. Public outrage over racial profiling and excessive force intensified with federal scrutiny and outside investigations. That ramped up pressure to make drastic change, says former prosecutor Charles Tucker, Jr. From a community standpoint, it, it represented an opportunity for the NYPD to be accountable. They're looking for someone to be accountable in these instances. City Hall got that message. Since then, the mayor says every NYPD officer has been retrained in de-escalation techniques. Stop and frisk has dropped 93 percent, and complaints against officers have dropped to the lowest level in 15 years. All at the same time, serious crime is at the lowest numbers in decades. It's a 180 from the old us versus them approach. The cornerstone is neighborhood policing. It's not a political strategy. It's a real policing strategy. If you look at the old model of policing, uh, the, the men and women of the NYPD, if you were in a sector car, all you did was answer radio runs eight hours a day. That's all you did. You had no time to make a, a connection to anyone. Now it's all about the connection. And nowhere is that strategy more visible than in the Brooklyn North Command, where officers routinely check in with local businesses and residents. Assistant Chief Jeffrey Madry says keeping people safe is the top priority, with community engagement a close second. What I tell my officers is to be first. Be first to stick your hand out and say hello and to shake a hand and to greet people. O'Neill says neighborhood policing is not just about feeling good. It's a key part of the crime fighting strategy. Along with precision policing, as opposed to wide net sweeps, new investigative techniques and improved technology. He says the new model is in keeping with the times. Giving the police officers uh, discretion, the ability to make decisions, to solve problems in conjunction with the community, I think, if anything, that's what I'm most proud of. Let me get our panel talking and introduce them to you. This man right here, you know him as Fat Joe, the hip hop superstar. You may not know him as the longtime community supporter. He has done more for our communities in a quiet way in many cases, going back since the beginning of his career. He was the first hip hop artist to ever appear on Hot 97 Street Soldiers, when they told us hip hop wouldn't last, that I wouldn't have a news career. Also with us is Chief Terrence Monahan. He's the NYPD Chief of Patrol. The reason we have him here is not just because he's got a lot of gold stars, but he's also one of the people behind the, this whole focus on this neighborhood policing, which I have to tell you about in the beginning, I was very skeptical about. I thought it was a, a PR political thing but I've been out there in the communities and are, 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 am seeing some changes. So Chief Monaghan, great to have you with us. Thank you very much. Um, those of you know City Council Member Jumani Williams, he represents Brooklyn. <laughs> also with us is Police Officer Eric M Morales. He's 23 years old. He listens to hip hop. He allegedly, I'm saying that because I haven't seen the video yet, he allegedly break dances to hip hop too, which I don't know, we may have to have a little, little demo later on, but we'll see how things go. Let's deal with the serious issues first. And he, he came on um, the job of police officer to the department 
in January 2016, which was right after a lot of the controversies and a lot of the tensions. So we have questions for him as well. But Joe, I want to start with you. How do you feel things are right now, the vibe on the streets? Well, <clears throat> of course, I'm very notable. I'm, I'm a famous guy. Uh, so things are a little bit different for me these days than they were when I was growing up as a teenager. So uh, my experience as of late after the Eric, the Eric Gardner situation is I've come across a lot of police officers who've been trying to make the effort, been trying to communicate more, been trying to ask me whenever they speak to me, when they see me in Harlem or in the Bronx, yo, how can we make things better? And uh, to be honest with you, I always like to come from a position of strength. And maybe I'm older now, but the, the most strength you could ever have is love. And I always like to have a peaceful outcome. I always pick love over everything else. So I'm very optimistic about where we can go or whatever the case may be. With that being said, we all heard that, right? Because we all listening and we talking. Um, I always hate when it's 2017 is the first of anything that has to do with black or Spanish people. Because our contribution to this country, to New York City, to everything we've done, we've given our life. I hate it when it's the first. It should have been 10,000 of these already, you know? So at the same time, you know, I love everybody. I want a peaceful outcome at the end of this uh, conversation, but I got to keep it as real as possible. Oh, and I know you will. <laughs> Chief uh, Terrence Monahan, the neighborhood policing concept. Joe talked about a little bit of a different vibe there, but does the whole department embrace that? Is it, is it department-wide, or is it just in certain places? No, this, <clears throat> this is a whole department philosophy. It, it's a change. It's a whole cultural change in the way we police. The concept here is to give discretion to our cops. As Joe just said, cops were able to talk to him, ask him how to, how to make change. Well, that's where it has to come. It has to come from the ground level. It has to come from the cops like Eric, from the, the cops that are out here that are on the street every day in Harlem, in the Bronx, that are talking to the community members. We don't move forward as a city with us trying to s decide what to be done. We have to work together with the communities, have the conversations, and move forward. Are we finished yet? Absolutely not. This is, this is a long cultural change. You know, we started in 2014, and we're still moving. We're in uh, 51 of our 77 commands right now. Hopefully by next year, we can finish the entire city and just keep that change going as we move forward. Giovanni, you sit on the City Council Public Safety Committee. You hear hours and hours and hours of testimony about the police. You've had encounters with police yourself. As a mem member of the City Council, as a man of color, what do you think about where we're at right now? Uh, I've been black for a pretty long time, uh, <laughs> so I've had a lot of encounters uh, with the police. Uh, I'm, I reek of Brooklyn, so I'm born and bred in Brooklyn. Um, I have to say most of my encounters have been great. Uh, that, doesn't take away, that doesn't take away from the ones ha that are negative and the experiences that many of us experience. So I, I have to be honest, we're not where we were a few years ago, and that's important to lift up because there are changes that are quantifiable and are tangible, and I think part of that is because of what happened in this country, and I do think it's because of the change in administration that we had, uh, the understanding of where we need to go. And so that is important that we say that. Um, there are, as mentioned in that video, whether it's the NCA program, um, stop, slow down, although the breakdown of who's being stopped is still problematic and who's being arrested for marijuana is still problematic, but those numbers are down. Um, but there are two areas where we haven't gone where we need to go, and that is in accountability and transparency. And those are the two areas that I think are preventing the changes that have actually occurred from being felt on the ground. Let me bring Eric in here. I don't want to let, leave him out. What made you want to become a police officer at a, at a time when there was so much negativity? Uh, thank you, Lisa. Um, I, being a police officer is something that I've always, you know, aspired to do and aspired to be. Um, coming on at the time that I did, there was, there was a lot going on. Um, my prior experience before this, I was, uh, I was in retail. I was in management, like you know, many other college students. Um, but I had the opportunity there. I, w I actually worked at a vitamin shop. And there I was able to help people with their goals through things that, I, that I've learned and through my experiences. So being able to pass that on to somebody and 
change, change their, their life in, in a small way translates to what we're able to do every day as police officers on this job. You know, we're able to reach out in many different ways, you know, speak to somebody in the community and maybe change their life a little bit that day. This is Street Soldiers, our special town hall episode on the NYPD and you policing in our communities, making changes. But have they gone far enough? I'm Lisa Evers. We'll be back right after this. When we talk about issues in our in our society, like homeless homelessness, it's the it's the police officers. The 911 call goes to you guys. A lot of these other issues, the 911 call goes, and police officers have to respond. What do you say about what Jumani? That basically it all falls in the lap of you know, the police. It, it, it's always been that way. With the police, we are the last resort. We're, we're the ones that you're going to call if something happens, if there's a problem in your neighborhood. And it's our responsibility to, to step up and do what we can. Can we solve everything? Absolutely not. But I tell you what, we have a lot of people, a lot of cops, a lot of initiative to try something that'll step out, that'll know how to do the Heimlich maneuver if you need it. And I, to, to, to Germani's point before about the racial injustice, we know in 2014 things weren't going right. We know there had to be changed. There's absolutely no way we can make that change overnight. It's going to take time, but we're moving in that direction. We acknowledge that there were problems in the past and that we have to move and we have to talk. The problem is when we're looking at TV and on camera, seeing blacks and Latinos getting murdered on TV, and the officers not getting held accountable, it makes the most peaceful man in the world cringe. And what he said was powerful. He said, man, cops, I know if, if I'm dying, this, I'm calling the cops, right? <laughs> they robbed my house, I'm calling them, right? I need them. But we asking the police officers to be psychiatrists. We asking them to be family. <laughs> you know, you arguing with your wife. We asking them to break up the fight. We, we asking a lot of, of you, a lot of you, right? I got that. I never really saw that angle before. But um, we need accountability, man. And the people keep feeling like maybe there's hope. Maybe there's hope. Let me tell you a secret. I am furious. I am outraged. I want to die when I see blacks and Latinos die by policemen on TV. But I feel the same way when I see police officers die. I feel the same way because I love these people because they're human. They're our people. And they save a lot of people. So who are we going to hold accountable for these deaths when police officers are shooting kids 12 years old, 11 years old, for playing in a park with a toy gun? And, and the difference between those two, because I, I feel the Wait, same way. You're talking about Cleveland, right. Yeah, but the difference, but the difference between when um, an officer is killed and it's horrible, like we all should pause and say that person is not going home to their family. But I guarantee you someone will be held accountable. When it's the other way around, the accountability isn't there. Okay, let me ask Chief Monahan, because there is this perception that you know people and a lot of the people that I've been talking to and a lot of people would agree, yes, there has been progress, but there's still a very strong sense that if somebody else dies as a result of their actions, most likely they're going to pay some kind of penalty, at least lose their job. They may get arrested. They may do time. But if a police officer clearly does something that is illegal, according to the department rules, like an illegal chokehold, they don't lose their job. Can you help us understand what that's all about? Absolutely. And first off, just the idea we talk about the, the, the Tamar Rice case in Cleveland is that something happens nationwide in this country. It reflects on every cop. This is New York City. What we are worried about are the residents and the people of New York City and how we police here in New York City. And, and listen, we have a, a robust uh, internal affairs division that really looks deeply at these cases. Not everything can be tried in, in the media or on TV or in the paper. There has to be a process. And there's a long process between district attorney's office, U.S. attorney's office, and then we get to take them into our trial room. Just a, a, a little known fact that uh, people don't realize, since 2014, 185 police officers have been fired for different acts that they've occurred. 
that's something that never seems to get out. It's something that we as a department probably don't get out as much as we should. Let's go to the uh, audience questions. What's your question or comment? And thank you for being here tonight. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Terry Saucier. I'm the Director of Employment Services for Opportunities for a Better Tomorrow. My question is, what I'm noticing, I work with young adults, 16 and 24, and a lot of them are being ticketed for things like spitting, chewing gum, you know, standing out in front of a building, and it's hindering their um, opportunities when it comes to employment services. You know, um, in some cases, even colleges that have started doing background checks as well. So, you know, I want to know what are you doing about that because those are meaningless things because a lot of these young adults may get a ticket and may not know they have to answer that ticket in court and it turns into a felony. On their name yes. And it goes into the system. Yes. Chief, it's what about, horrible. What about these quality of life substances? Again, this is something that we're giving discretion to our cops. Past practices, we were, we, it was a very arrest oriented, summons oriented department. It was coming from the top down. We're now giving our cops discretion whether or not they need to resolve that issue. We always have to deal with quality of life complaints. We go out to any community meeting. It's the first thing any commanding officer or any cop gets is the different quality of life issues on their block. So yes, our cops are going to go out there and deal with it, but they have options. They don't have to arrest. They don't have to summons as long as they can resolve the issue. And that's what it's all about. I know the city council has introduced a lot of bills where we now have civil options for some of these summonses that we can give out. And with a civil option, then it doesn't record onto your, uh, onto your criminal record. It's just a fine at that point. Hawk Newsom, leader of the Black Lives New York, you have a question or comment? Uh, yeah. Um, I appreciate the PR stunt that you have going on here, but I'm in three different boroughs every day. And when I see these little black and brown faces standing in front of police, the police are never smiling at them. They're arresting them, and they're standing there in handcuffs. This is not what we see in the streets. Okay, and there was a question about mental illness, about training on mental All right, illness. let me let him get a response in first, and I'm okay. going to challenge you on that. This is not a publicity stunt. Okay. We put a lot of work into bringing no, everybody in. I respect what you're an doing, Lisa. To no, you. no, no. And I respect. An yes, to yes. You. I so respect. Give me the platform. And I ask, you, I ask you, the rules of the town hall, which I told you are that we're going to allow people to respond. You're making one a very serious accusation, and I would like to give the I chief a chance to respond yeah. to that. Thank you. Yeah. And one question per person. Go ahead. All right. This, this, is, this is a whole philosophical change for the police department. This is important. We need to end the rhetoric. There can't be rhetoric on either side. There can't be rhetoric against our communities. There can't be rhetoric against our cops. It is important for us to have conversation. I'm here today to have this conversation. My cops are out there each and every day now holding meetings, which we'd love to have you attend, to have conversations, to get to know the cop, get to know him by his first name. Don't look at him as a blue uniform. Get to know your cops. Go to the meetings. Introduce yourself. We can't start on a negative angle. We can't come in right off the bat. Ah, oh, you guys are bad. We can't go in there to a community. I can't go into the houses in Brooklyn and say, ah, oh, you guys are bad. No, we have to look at one another as human and have conversation. I want to thank you, Chief, for falling on a sword and taking the bashing in here tonight. <laughs> but it's the only way we're gonna get ahead is embracing each other, talking to each other, and showing love to each other. So I appreciate you, Chief, and let's keep this talk going. Let's definitely keep it talk. Give it up for our audience. Give it up for our panelists, Eric Morales, Jumani Williams, Chief Terrence Monahan, Fat Joe, and I want to thank everybody that came out and uh, was part of this important groundbreaking town hall. Let's do it again, really. We'll do it again. And uh, I want to thank you so much for being, being with us for this special town hall episode of Street Soldiers. I'm Lisa Evers. Remember, use your mind. It's your best weapon. I hope it's your only weapon. And let's push for peace. Peace.